Welcome back, everyone. I know folks want to network um, and chat, and there'll be plenty of opportunities for that as we go on. Uh, before I introduce our next uh, panel, our, our next moderator, I just want to make a couple of comments about what I heard this morning. To me, I heard sort of several key things. One that Arun talked about, and this notion of not just figuring out how to get down cost curves, but how to get better cost curves. It seems to me that's really an overarching theme of, if you will, the energy innovation movement. Uh, the second point was, I think, a key point that Devin made, which is that that's not in conflict with deployment strategies, but it suggests that we need to kind of, we, we need to have new kinds of deployment strategies around smart deployment, which CETA would have done. Uh, last point I'll make is on carbon tax and the debate on that. Breakthrough's done work on that. We've done work on that. My colleague Matt Horahan uh, has done a piece, Matt's, is it? Matt Stepp did a piece, excuse me, on the limits of price, which looked at, uh, that was your piece. It's very confusing when you have two Matts that are doing uh, energy innovation and they look alike too, so. Uh, uh, a piece on the limits of price and, uh, you know, to me the sort of signal case as to why price is, is useful but not enough is the Netherlands. Because in the Netherlands they have a $400 a ton carbon tax, if you will, a de facto one, which is their gasoline tax. Uh, they have a huge gasoline tax in many European countries of uh, what would be equivalent to $400 a ton. They have no all-electric cars in the Netherlands. What the carbon tax has done in the Netherlands is it's basically a lot of people ride bikes, a lot of people take metro or transit, and a lot of people drive small gas cars. But without the innovation that Arun talked about this morning to get much better batteries, price doesn't get you better batteries. And I think that's a key point here, and that's part of what we're going to talk about right now, which is how do we get those new cost curves? How do we get clean energy, the unsubsidized cost of clean energy, to be cheaper than fossil fuels? And we have a, a, a great moderator uh, now, uh, Alexis Madrigal, uh, who is um, the senior editor covering technology for theatlantic.com. Uh, he's also author of a forthcoming book about the surprisingly long history of green technology. When is that book coming out? It's actually out. That's what I thought. That's what I thought. Your book is out. What's the name of the book? Uh, it's called Powering a Dream. Yeah. That's what the, so I think you need to update your bio on your website. That, that would be <laughs> it's my It's true. It's true. Alexis, they need to do it. Yeah, they need does to that. do it. And these yeah. media people. Yeah, it's called Powering the Dream, the History and Promise of Green Technology. Mostly focused on the United States. Yeah. Uh, and he's also the founder of uh, 48 Hour Magazine, a high-speed media experiment uh, that got attention from the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, BBC. He was also at Wired.com, where he built Wired Science into the, one of the most popular blogs in the world. Uh, he was also co-founded Haiti Rewired, which is a groundbreaking community de dedicated to the discussion of technology and the future of Haiti. He's also a visiting scholar at UC Berkeley's Office of the History of Science and Technology. So Alexis, thank you. Thank you, Rob. Um, I am tasked with introducing uh, what is, I think, going to be an excellent panel. Um, I think when you've been around the energy innovation space um, enough, it's kind of difficult to get beyond a lot of the platitudes as well as a lot of the binaries that people have about energy R&D versus deployment uh, and, and a lot of these uh, issues that tend to hang us up. And I'm kind of hoping that we can dig deeper in this session the necessary conditions for, as Rob says, getting not just down cost curves, but, but better cost curves. Um, to my right is Matt Horahan. Uh, he is obviously from the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation, uh, which I feel like I just rearrange those words every time I say them. <laughs> um, he is clean energy policy analyst there and uh, a long time wonk, if you don't mind me describing you that way. Uh, next to him is Letha Tani. She's a senior associate at the World Resources Institute, uh, focusing on climate and energy. It's going to be bringing a kind of comparative uh, approach. Uh, worked a lot on international issues, not just narrowly on U.S. policy, uh, and has spent some time working on bioenergy uh, for the UN as well. Next to her is Nate, uh, associate director for energy innovation at the Bipartisan Policy Center. Uh, has written a lot on these topics, um, particularly around, um, as he, he was telling me before, uh, carbon pricing, so we have a, an expert in that, and, and now moving on to clean energy financing. 
Next time we have Ramesh, who is the director of the Sunshot uh, Initiative uh, with the Department of Energy, trying to get the cost of solar uh, competitive with fossil fuels uh, by the end of the decade. Um, the format for this particular panel is we're going to go down the line, just like this, in the order that I introduce them, in the order that you see them. Uh, they're going to talk for five to seven minutes uh, about a topic, this, this topic. Um, and then we're going to go to questions, both mine and yours. Um, you can get them in as in the last panel, and I will uh, judiciously choose a, from among them. Uh, so Matt, why don't you get us going? Okay, thank you. Um, so panel is about how to drive innovation, um, and I thought I'd sp start off by spending a few minutes talking about um, a tool that's commonly you know, mentioned as a way to drive innovation, that's the carbon price, uh, as Rob uh, mentioned earlier. Um, it might seem kind of odd to start out you know, with a carbon price, or discussion of a carbon price, because it is kind of a non-starter. But the idea of a carbon price um, as being a, an innovation driver, I mean, it, it's, it's a persistent idea. I mean, just a few weeks ago, I'm gonna quote now a paper from uh, Robert Stevens and Joseph Aldi at Harvard. Um, they write, uh, carbon pricing can promote cost-effective abatement, deliver powerful innovation incentives, uh, and ameliorate rather than exacerbate government fiscal problems. And, you know, it's, it's, I think it's unlikely, unlikely that this idea is gonna, gonna go away. Um, you know, and I, I think that statements like this, I mean, I think they're, they're in terms of innovation, they're kind of correct. Um, and, uh, you know, by that I mean, I think it's useful to think of innovation almost on a sliding scale. Um, on the one end of the scale, we have, you know, what you could think of as incremental innovation. You know, pretty, pretty straightforward. I mean, it's when, uh, you know, a factory adopts more efficient processes on the factory floor to improve productivity uh, or increase output. Um, tend to be incremental kinds of innovation. Um, the wind power industry, I mean, it's, it's very much a story of incremental innovation, you know, steady improvements over time, over, you know, over decades, um, leading to larger, larger turbines um, and, uh, um, you know, better performing turbines as well as, uh, you know, operational improvements. Um, it's very much a, kind of an incremental story. Um, now, this incremental innovation is important, um, you know, in solving our energy challenges but it's not the only kind of innovation, of course. On the other end, we have radical innovation. Radical innovations are the kinds of things that we heard Arun talk about this morning. Um, you know, uh, the pursuit of uh, genetics research in, uh, you know, in, in the pursuit of uh, improved feedstocks for biofuels, um, things along those lines. I and mean, this is more radical stuff. Um, again, very important, at least as important as incremental innovation, if not more so. I mean, if, if you survey kind of the, the full range of energy technologies, I think it's pretty clear that every single one of them can benefit from radical innovation in some way, and some much more than others, in fact. Um, and for some, it's, it's absolutely central uh, to, to the challenge of making uh, clean energy uh, cost competitive with, with fossil fuels. Um, so, I mean, so we've got this, this kind of, you know, incremental uh, and radical dynamic. Uh, now, when we talk about the kinds of innovation that uh, car a carbon price might induce, uh, you know, I mean, we're talking about induced, innova uh, induced innovation. Uh, and induced innovation is a concept that's pretty well established uh, in the economics literature, uh, you know, in agriculture, in many fields. Um, but, the, but the challenge is that induced innovation tends to be, on the face of it, incremental. And this is kind of a, you know, it's a generalization, but I think it's a useful kind of mental concept. Um, you know, in, in energy specifically, I mean, there's clear evidence that when energy prices go up, um, household appliances become more efficient, uh, you know, uh, uh, vehicles uh, become, uh, become more efficient, demand for more efficient vehicles goes up. This is pretty well established. Um, and it's a similar dynamic when we're talking about regulations. Um, you know, when the uh, sulfur dioxide trading program uh, took effect in 1990, um, it, it did drive some levels of innovation of you know, a very incremental kind. You know, so fuel switching, um, scrubber, scrubber technology became uh, more efficient over time with experience. Um, you know, incremental innovation tends to be very much engineering based, it's about problem solving, doesn't require a lot of fundamentally new knowledge. Um, now, you know, we, you know, we, I, we have to be clear here that, that incremental innovation, while being important, is, is, is not the whole ballgame. Um, another actually good case study for kind of the effect of carbon prices uh, to drive incremental innovation is what we saw in the 1970s uh, during the energy crisis. Um, you know, energy prices spiked. I mean, the international price of oil quadrupled in a few years. Um, and, you know, what happened? I mean, we did see some uh, marginal investment in radical alternatives, but for the most part, by and large, um, 
you know, the, 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 the preponderance of private sector activity was towards efficiency. Uh, you know, energy using uh, firms adopted more efficient capital goods. Uh, you know, again, the demand for uh, fuel efficient vehicles uh, increased. Um, you know, and again, this, this is important, but it's, this is not the kind of innovation that's going to get us to this, you know, this, this energy transformation that we're looking for um, on its own. You know, and there's, I mean, there's very clear reasons for this. You know, uh, you know if we were to uh, adopt a carbon price, I think we'd, you know, we'd expect investments in efficiency. Um, we'd expect um, you know, most, most kind of private activity to really be focused along um, kind of more predictable, less risky pathways. It's just a, a kind of a, you know, a, a fact of the fact of the matter when it comes to innovation. Um, so I guess the, the, the question then is, you know, how do, we, how do we drive more radical innovation? And I think the history here is actually pretty clear, is that uh, changes in, in price, you know, whether it's carbon price or anything else, um, as Rob mentioned uh, earlier, uh, very rarely lead to those radical kinds of breakthroughs, um, that, that innovation on you know, kind of a, a massive scale. Uh, we actually wrote a, a, well, the, the paper that Rob mentioned, the limits of, of, uh, of carbon price. Um, we actually went through and kind of traced the history in several different fields um, to kind of try and see what kind of a role price changes in the market played in spurring innovative activity. And in almost every case, uh, you know, price changes were, were very minimal. Um, you know, price is much more important when it comes to diffusion and experience-based uh, uh, learning, experience-based uh, innovation. Um, but from, you know, in the life sciences, in uh, you know, computers, um, you know, kind of across the board, these more radical kinds of innovation tend to be much more about um, the, the, the search for new knowledge, um, the search for, um, you know, for, for better ways of doing things, for better technology, um, it's much more about um, uh, you know, uh, you know research activities and that, that kind of thing. Um, now you know, and you know, it's also worth stating, um, and I'm sure you're going to hear this you know more throughout the day. I mean, government obviously has played a massive role in innovation um, in many of these fields of the radical kind. Um, you know, again, that's through uh, research investments. Uh, it's through uh, facilitating um, you know the transfer of novel technologies into the marketplace. Is through uh, facilitating scale up, um, but in most of the you know advanced industries that we think of today, I mean, government has played um, government's really been there all along. Uh, you know, through the you know, been there uh, uh, the whole way, um, kind of you know playing a, an incredibly uh, constructive role. Um, I know that's kind of a dangerous thing to say, given uh, you know we're in a post cylinder world here, um, but this is kind of the reality of how radical innovation works. Um, and I know there are a lot of folks who. Um, you know, who, who see a cylindra and use that as evidence is, well, you know, government, you know, therefore has no role to play in technology development, the creation of new industries. That's wrong. I mean, that's just flat out wrong. Government has a very important role to play. Um, I think we're much better off trying to learn some, uh, learn the lessons of cylindra um, and get better at providing that, that support for innovation rather than walking away from it entirely. I, mean, that's, I think that's, you know, uh, it's a really important uh, point to make. Um, last thing I'll say, um, you know, I've, so in saying all this, I'm actually, you know, it's, it's, this is an argument for not having a carbon price. We actually should have a carbon price for, for many, many reasons. I mean, you know, the, the, the kinds of signals that it can provide to the market, those are important. Um, you know, driving efficiency, that's important. It's also important to use a, a carbon price as a, a source of revenues to, to support the kinds of in, uh, investment innovation that we need. Um, so, you know, I'll end it there. I guess, you know, last, last thing I'll say is, you know, next time, you know, you hear somebody saying that carbon prices are you know, uh, a big driver of innovation. Just, you know, remember to, to kind of ask yourself, what kind of innovation are they talking about? And, you know, carbon prices are important, but they don't deliver the, the radical levels of innovation that we need. Thanks, Dan. Can I ask you, I'm just gonna cut in for one second. Um, what would you call an energy breakthrough, or a radical innovation in energy that's happened already over the last 25 years? Like, a radical innovation? Yeah, I mean, do we have any examples? You know, we have the wind industry as an example of... Uh, sure. sure, I mean, that's, that's yeah, incremental. I mean, I, you know, I, I, I call the, you know, the, the invention of the solar panel itself, you know, going back, you know, decades. I and mean, it has roots in, you know, a lot of the research that was pursued by, uh, you know, DOE, NASA, et cetera. I mean, I think that kind of thing is, I mean, I'd, I'd qualify that as, you know, a, as a breakthrough. Now, uh, you, know, it, you know, it's using the, using kind of the phrase breakthrough, I mean, it's, 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 it's hard to, it's, it's kind of a subjective term, you know, I mean, I think what it comes down to is, 
fostering discontinuous innovation, right? It's a technolo technology development that doesn't really have clear or you know directly connected antecedents in technology that came that came before. You know, I mean, there's there are relationships between you know different generations of technology, and you know it's in some cases the, the you know the magnitude is uh, the magnitude of change is quite small, in other cases it's quite large. Um, you know, so I mean, I, but I, you know, I, so I compare, you know, the, the invention of the, of the solar panel, panel in and of itself, um, you know, and then, you know, and then some of the progress that's been made in solar panels as well. And it's, I, 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 I call those, you know, again, breakthroughs when we're looking at new generations of technologies that represent fundamentally new cost curves and, and kind of leaps forward. So, great. Thank you. You're up. Great. Well, so why? Why is it these market creation tools, particularly the carbon price that Matt's mentioned, are good at incremental innovation and not necessarily as good at radical innovation? Our research at World Resources Institute points to how critical it is to think about the whole innovation system. So echoing what Dr. Majumdar said this morning, and I'll explain a little bit about the seven functions we think healthy innovation systems need to provide. But if all you've done is, is one of these functions, create the market, for the product by putting a price on carbon, a sufficient price on carbon, as Devin pointed out in the previous panel, uh, you, leave, you leave space for low risk innovations, but higher risk innovations are, really need the entire ecosystem, the entire innovation system to be healthy uh, in order to have a better odds of success. In a recent paper we put out, uh, Two Degrees of Innovation, uh, we make the case for why innovation is critical to getting abundant low carbon power. Uh, and, you know, as an example, we point to wind turbines. The way um, the efficiency of wind turbines, the size of wind turbines, has, has changed by orders of magnitude uh, over the last 25 years, 30 years reduces their footprint. So from an environmental perspective, the World Resources Institute being an environmental think tank uh, primarily, that reduces their footprint, it reduces their, their ecological impact, it reduces the amount of land you need, it reduces the amount of input you need to, to produce the same amount of electricity, and that's really important uh, for all kinds of reasons, including cost. And healthy innovation systems are crucial to that. They're also a really tremendous, uh, and Mark um, uh, Murrow's work over at Brookings really points to this, but so does all sorts of work around the world. Healthy innovation systems are a really critical um, competitive advantage for a region and allow a region to compete in the global economy more effectively um, just as a as a side co-benefit to having a healthy ecosystem. Um, so first let's talk about a little bit about what the healthy innovation system is. First off it's not just uh, guys in lab coats working on new materials for batteries. It's we have a wonderful research system in the US but we need to think beyond that it's the engineers in the field figuring out how to eke that more that one more percent out of wind turbines. It's the supply chain managers on the manufacturing floor figuring out how to optimize those three more cents out of the uh, out of the cost of goods. It's the business uh, entrepreneurs who are thinking about how to lease solar panels to homeowners to overcome some of the barriers that residential solar systems face. So all of these folks are innovators that need to have increased odds of success in order to stand up this whole energy transformation. We have to get beyond thinking about innovation as being in the lab, and, and I, I appreciated Devin's point in the earlier panel, really integrating more effectively this sense of research and deployment and how they're connected and that there are innovators that deserve support throughout the life cycle of a product. And we need them all to be successful. So in that vein, you know, the research, the, the 40 years of research on innovation literature sort of long ago quit debating about whether um, government had or did not have a role in innovation. It's they, the public sector is part of the innovation system and the debate is much more in the research how are they impacting innovators? Are they helping or are they hindering? But this idea that somehow they can be hands off in, in the literature just doesn't hold up. Um, and so I think getting to a, a much more helpful debate about are you getting in the way of innovators, or are you supporting innovators, and what's the appropriate way to do that um, would, would it's, it's certainly where other countries have gotten in their discussions in, about this topic, and I would encourage us to follow the research in that direction. So the seven, if, if innovation systems are not just a carbon tax, um, 
What do they look like? Well, they look very different all over the world. My research looks at innovation systems around the world. Uh, and they all take different shapes. So, for instance, India is really standing up a, a, an innovation system in their solar mission. And it'll be interesting to see how successful they are. But they're very, being very explicit about thinking about all of these functions that the innovation system needs to provide entrepreneurs and innovators in the solar industry in India. Uh, and I think Sunshot, I'm excited to hear more about the Sunshot program because I think the Sunshot program in the U.S is fulfilling a, a similar sort of role in the solar industry, although their mandate is, is uh, a little more tightly bounded. So the seven functions, the first of course is creating markets. So as Matt said, a carbon price is critical, or maybe it's a feed-in tariff, maybe it's a renewable portfolio standard. There's a lot of ways to create a, a market for the technology that we want to provide to, to allow innovators to charge that premium for that, that great innovation that they have. Um, the second function is infrastructure. So this doesn't get a lot of attention, but innovators are just not going to be very successful if they can't get their product to market. And so that means in the energy transmission. And we see this in our work around feed-in tariffs in the developing world. You see an energy regulator put a huge amount of work into getting a feed-in tariff in place to drive deployment and hopefully create domestic jobs. And he never re leans over and talks to the grid operator and says, oh, by the way, I'm going to bring 100 megawatts of solar onto the grid. Are you ready? Uh, <laughs> you see this in the developed world as well, these huge queues of, of generators trying to get access to the grid and then, oh my goodness, the feed-in tariff is failing. And no, if you want your innovators to be successful, they have to be able to get to the market. They need infrastructure. Um, Another, uh, you see this also in, in uh, how overloaded grids become, both in the developed and developing world. You hear about wind being curtailed because the grid isn't, is not ready yet to cope with a uh, huge onslaught. Um, the third function also gets, I think, very short shrift, and that's governance and regulation. So you put in a market creation mechanism like a feed-in tariff or an RPS, maybe you, you get your grid operator on board, but then you never actually write the grid codes, the rules that say how a generator should, what safety equipment he needs and how he certifies his equipment to connect to the grid. Or you don't clarify the land use rules, or the trade regime is in flux, or there's a whole set of governance and regulation that impacts the risk that the innovator faces. Now, those standards can be very high. You can have very high environmental standards. Innovators will figure out how to meet them. But if they're unclear, if they're over constraining to new solutions, they can get in the way uh, of the innovator finding a path to success. And I'd emphasize here how critical it is to have good governance principles, which I think also in the energy community gets a little bit of short shrift. WRI has an energy um, and electricity governance initiative that's explicitly about bringing transparency and civil society to the table in developing country electricity sectors that have deregulated over the last decade. And it, from an innovation perspective, this is crucial. If you don't have transparency and how prices are set and who's getting what subsidies and why and how that public investment is being spent, then you don't necessarily, you, you risk regulatory capture. And we talk a lot about that in terms of the fossil industry and we complain about subsidies for fossil or entitlements for fossils, the previous panel said. Um, and we don't think we talk about it quite enough about new entrants. So new entrants are just as likely to seek regulatory capture, sort of human nature economic theory. And I think there's an important countervailing force that needs to be in place in the governance regime in order to make sure that we're really driving, we're really demanding improved price and improved performance from these folks. Um, Finance gets lots of attention, so I won't pay a huge amount of attention to it here. The piece that's interesting that RPE is doing in addition to finance is the collaborative networks piece. So innovators need larger networks to find solutions to their problems. The classic function everybody's aware of and identifies is the knowledge creation. So that's our great research institutions. India's investing in their research institutions as part of their solar mission. So that's what people tend to think of when they think of an innovation system. That's just one of the pieces. Uh, and then you can't skip the capable workforce. So if you don't have access to the experience and the human capacity, you're going to struggle to solve the problems that come up along the way. Uh, and it's crucial to be thinking about how we prepare a workforce or keep a workforce in 
in the U.S. or uh, draw a workforce to the U.S. that is, cap is capable in these technologies. So 40 years of literature points to the fact that it's not important quite how you deliver the services, but that the services are delivered. And that means government has, a, has an important role in figuring out how they get how they get delivered in this political context, but there isn't a policy prescription that says if you do these five steps, you will have a successful innovation system. It's about doing what works best in your political context, and I think that's tremendously a huge opportunity in our current sort of uh, bound up debate in the US. Um, and I think from an environmental perspective, if an environmentalist really wants to see these technologies uh, reach cost parity, they need to be thinking across all of these functions, not just the one piece, the market creation, or a regulation, or uh, some knowledge creation. But we need to be thinking much more holistically. So, thank you very much. Thank you. I'm going to have a couple of questions for you about what the right uh, sort of geographical unit is for these innovation centers later. But, uh, yeah. but let's keep moving down the line. All right, great. Uh, just quick thanks to ITIF for doing the heavy lifting to put mm. this together. Yeah. Um, very glad to be here. Uh, I've got a 50-page slide deck that I'm going to try to get through in about five minutes, so brace yourselves. That always works. <laughs> yeah. Just kidding. <laughs> Um, so I'm tasked with uh, talking, uh, with making the case for energy R&D, especially on the early side. And I think, um, given the conversations that we've had before, we can all pretty much agree that we need R&D to make the incremental gains to come down the cost curves, and that we need R&D, probably a whole heck of a lot more of it, to actually shift the cost curve and make more of the radical innovation. Um, I think the more interesting questions here are, you know, who's going to do it and how should it be done? So a few quick points on those just to open. Uh, I think it's pretty clear that the private sector uh, in the energy space is going to be critical at uh, developing, commercializing, and uh, deploying new clean energy technologies. It's a fact. We live in a capital, uh, capitalist country. They're the primary driver of uh, uh, capital investments. We need them. However, the private sector in energy critically underinvests in R&D. In fact, as an industry, the industry as a whole invests less than one half of one percent. One half of one percent of their total revenues go into research and development. In the utility sector, it's less than that. It's one tenth of one percent. The five major oil and gas companies, it's a quarter of one percent of their total revenues that go back in energy R&D. Um, a recent survey by Battelle uh, that surveyed the entire U.S. energy industry, it includes uh, developers, manufacturers, and suppliers, found that about 3.1 billion dollars was invested in energy R&D, and that's not just clean energy R&D, that's R&D writ large. That is a paltry sum when you look at the five trillion dollar global market that exists out there. And it's easy to see why that we have many of the same technologies that we've had for the last 40 years when we're investing just, you know, not even cents on the dollar. Um, someone needs to step in, especially on the early side, uh, to fill this critical gap and make these investments. Um, the federal government has a history of doing it pretty well. We've had significant payoffs from it, and they're really the only player that can come in on the early side to make the investments commensurate with the challenges that we have from our energy system. So, how should it be done? Um, the BBC is fortunate to staff and host the uh, American Energy Innovation Council. It's a group of business leaders led by Bill Gates, Chad Holliday, Norm Augustine, Jeff Immelt, Ursula Burns, Tim Solso, and John Doerr, who in 2010 came together to actually make these exact two points. One is that as a country, we are critically underinvesting in this space. And two, they think that smart public investments can really catalyze a whole pipeline of energy technologies to come down in the future. Um, 2010, we released a report. We recently updated that uh, with a handful of high-level recommendations about how we can improve the early side of our innovation pipeline. So I'll just run through a couple of those quickly. But uh, the first and perhaps the most critical point, which is arguably toughest in this fiscal environment, is that we need to spend a whole heck of a lot more money in this space. Public investments have hovered between two and three billion bucks for about the last decade. Uh, you compare that with uh, healthcare R&D, which is about 30 billion bucks a year. Defense is about 80 billion bucks a year. We really need to kick up our investments in this space to make sure that we're actually feeding the technologies that are going to improve the mid and the longer term down the road. Um, and so in the eyes of these business leaders, they think that we should ramp up our about 3 billion bucks today to about 16 billion dollars a year in our, primarily R&D investments. 
Um, but we also need to do it better. We need to do it more strategically. We need to have a better coordinated plan that actually assesses at a portfolio level how we're going to make these investments at DOE, which is a primary driver, but also at other agencies outside of DOE. We need to make sure that they are aligned well, they complement each other in terms of the goals. You need to make sure that you actually create a balanced portfolio both across technologies, time horizons, and risk profiles. Um, we also need to make sure that these investments are directed at places where can, they can make real, real benefits in the eyes of uh, the, uh, enter, the uh, AIC. They believe that RPE is one of the best dollar-for-dollar dollar investments that we can make. We should actually not argue about an extra $70 million here in the current budget debate, but rather over time we need to ramp up funding for an organization like that if it can continue to show demonstrable uh, results and attract the top talent that it has to about a billion bucks a year. We also need to focus on areas that really aggregate top talent, top facilities, and take on grand challenges in a pretty unique way. Uh, to this end, I think we're pretty excited about uh, the work at DOE in terms of the innovation hubs and uh, the Energy Frontier Research Centers. I believe these should uh, be ramped up accordingly. Um, and lastly, we need to do better with um, the current programs in place. We need to make sure that our institutions are functioning uh, flexibly, nimbly, and uh, are accountable for the money that we're putting in. So we need, you know, a couple top things that we need to do is that we need to make sure that program managers are the best and the brightest out there, and that we actually can get them in the door and retain them. Uh, we need to make sure that we assess portfolio. Uh, for a long time, we've had kind of siloed, stovepiped uh, energy, applied energy programs. We need to make sure they're actually complementary. We avoid duplication. We cut down on overhead costs, and that we can balance the right technology uh, plans for the future. Uh, we also need rigorous, transparent review process. We need to make sure that everything is uh, is vetted to the best extent possible and that the top ideas and the top talent actually gets money in their pocket. And lastly, we, we need the ability to cancel projects. Um, some projects sound great and go awry very quickly. We need to, you know, government has not, we have the ability to do it, but we actually haven't been that great at, once we've made an initial investment, of saying, okay, hey, let's put on the brakes. We actually didn't do quite as good a job as we needed to. And this money could now be better uh, directed elsewhere. And so I think with uh, greater investment and some institutional changes and some priorities. Uh, I think it's the in the council's eyes, it's very clear that we need these investments and that we can do them effectively. Go ahead. Yeah. So, um, my name is Ramesh. Um, my colleagues did a fantastic job of setting the stage for Sinshot. Um, I'm on leave from Berkeley. Um, and so, about a year or so ago, Steve Chu called. He said, Hey, you know, I need you to come and help out. You know, and, and Steve Chu, when he calls you, you say, woof, woof, and you go there. And he's just an outstanding individual. He's incredibly committed to, to everything that we're talking about. Um, the Sunshot Initiative, I should tell you a little bit. Uh, Antonio talked uh, briefly about it. So give you a few minutes of, of what does it do, how does it do, why does it do. Um, the premise for Sunshot is very interesting. The fundamental premise was, can you bring solar electricity down to grid parity, about five cents a kilowatt hour, but not with any of the Mickey Mouse, not, no subsidies, nothing at all, purely through science and technology. And for a tech jock like me, I said, oh, that's very fascinating. Uh, can we really do that? And it's about a 75% reduction in the cost structure. Said, mm, yeah, our immediate answer is, of course, we can do it. You know, uh, We have no shortage of confidence on that matter. So we've been getting into what Antonio talked about. It turns out that, that it is indeed possible if we do certain innovations. And the time constant for us is the end of the decade, which seemed like a reasonable number. There was nothing um, sacrosanct about it. Originally, we said 2017. Then we chickened out a little bit. We said, OK, 20, 2020 is a good number. So the cost structure is 5 cents a kilowatt hour. And of course, you will hear a lot of stuff about, um, about um, environmental impacts and stuff. All of those are probably true. But by far the biggest thing I want you guys to take away is the fact that the big footnote for Sunshot is competitiveness. And you've heard from the previous panel about what the stakes are. And I'm going to give you some examples as we go through my John Stewart uh, uh, monologue version of why is it that we as a country need to be 
engaged in this process. We actually don't have a choice, we should be. Uh, and the driver is not environment. The driver is competitiveness, it's the size of these markets. So that's the, the, the big push behind Sunshot. How does one go about doing it? Um, uh, my colleague to the left here talked about people. It was absolutely uh, crucial for us that we had the right people. I, I can tell you that we didn't have the right people. And the first thing we did was that Sunshot is not in the office of electricity. It's not in the office of uh, basic energy sciences. It's across DOE. We see no boundaries. And it is an organization which has the full spectrum of TRL uh, using DOE, NASA language, the technology readiness level. We are a one-stop shopping mall for solar. Uh, we go all the way from TRL1, which is basic energy sciences. There's some fun, beautiful work going on in the Office of Science, which is looking at the 20-year horizon. What happens when you have a totally different architecture for solar? Uh, the photon to electron conversion. On the other end of the spectrum, we have things going on at the three to six to nine month time horizon, TRL9 projects, which is looking at how do I break down market barriers? So what are the various things? So that takes me automatically to uh, the, the, the cost structure for Sunshot. So if you look at the cost structure, Antonio talked about the module, which is a more fancy, jazzy version. But the real issue in the solar is not the cost structure. You could see that has a learning curve, approximately 20, 25% reduction in the cost structure. So you just wait it out, the price likely will come to about 70, 80 cents. With push from Sunshot, it'll go below the 50 cent requirement. Our cost structure by 2020 is approximately 50 cents for the module. 40 cents for what we call the balance of systems, which is a very goofy animal. And about 10 cents for the power electronics, converting DC electricity to AC electricity. Now if you look at the three different kinds of markets, the utility scale, the commercial scale, and the residential scale, those numbers vary quite a bit. If you look at Antonio's numbers, he mentioned the $5. Let's use that as a reference frame for the residential. The module doesn't cost $250, it only is about uh, depending on who you buy it from, you can get it for a dollar twenty, perhaps. So the rest of it is this balance of systems, and which is, which has got all kinds of things. There are four basic things that go into it, and we're attacking all of them. Permitting is a very complicated issue, and we talked about the feed-in tariff in Europe, which works because they're relatively homogeneous, top-down. Won't likely work in this country. And so we said, hey, let's ask the people to come up with the best algorithms. And we're running something called the Rooftop Challenge, where we're asking various communities, cities, to come up with algorithms, which will make them very effective. The question is, why is it that New York City has a nine-month permitting period and it costs them $3,000? You go to San Jose, it's 300 bucks and two hours. It's a huge spectrum. You go to two cities within the state of California, they don't have the same permitting forms. You go to California and Wisconsin, no, they don't have the same permitting forms. How does one do that in a way that everybody embraces them, it's bottom sum. So we're trying to use scientific methods and we're still collecting data by these processes, but in the process trying to create a uniform, very rapid, very efficient process. We can take up the inspection issues. There are four different kinds of inspector. I didn't know that until I tried to put solar in my house and I couldn't afford it anyway. You know, there are four kinds of people who come and look at you. It's like you go to a hospital you now, different people come with the same stethoscope and say, okay, you have this, this, this. We're saying, hey, why do you need to do that? Why can't you do a single inspection? And that can be addressed in two different ways. One is a very fundamental question, which is an R&D question, which says, hey, I don't want to inspect, I don't want to permit, how do I make my solar panel like a TV? And you look at the English, they still have a permit fee. I remember in India, when I was growing up, we had a permit fee to own a TV. And then they figured out, oh, it's not worth it, let's just go straight and give people the TV. We're asking, why can't you do a solar panel like a TV? You take it out of the box and, and simply hook it up. There are technology issues there, there are safety issues, but that's why you innovate. That's one of the big areas there's going to be a solicitation coming up in a month it's called the plug and play. You've heard about it in various forums. But this is a new area for innovation where you put all the intelligence, the communication, the safety, the sensing intelligence onto the panel. And hopefully in this process you create a technology that doesn't exist today. You create intel new intellectual property. I want to spend a couple of minutes on some other things as well. So I talked about the rooftop challenge. 
We've talked a lot about innovation, okay? I can tell you, I, I come from the science background, I come from the Bell Labs background. A lot of the stuff, I solved the 30 year problem, the memory technology. Guess where it's being manufactured today? I don't need to tell you where it is. We, I think we all need to go back, and this is something that in the program, I have uh, my colleague Lydia who's sitting there who's pushing a program. We have a serious issue in this country of not taking stuff, I mean, football analogy. We go all the way to the 20 yard line, and then we go score a field goal instead of scoring a touchdown. We have a problem in terms of taking innovation all the way to the logical endpoint. In terms of hardware sciences, that is in terms of manufacturing, putting jobs on the street. Instead, as a matter of fact, the day I took this job, and Steve Chu called me in the evening, a friend of mine from Stanford said, hey, come on over, meet some people. And was a friend of mine who's a professor, and he said, you know what, I gotta take the one o'clock flight to Beijing. I said, what's going on? He said, I'm meeting people. It turns out that he was getting money from, you know, from Chinese uh, banks to start a battery company. I said, wow. I'm watching technology leave. Technology is funded by the taxpayer, NSF, et cetera, et cetera. Leave right in front of my eyes. And so we need to find a way to complete this transition of knowledge base innovation into jobs in the country. So we ran a, a, a solicitation which is on the street right now which said, hey, we will find a way to give you money. If you're a company like Alta Devices, whatever, in the solar space, and you have done fantastic innovation, and you're ready to manufacture, and you heard from my colleagues about the cost of capital. It's a big, big issue in, this, in the solar business. As a matter of fact, that is the strategic differentiator. So we said, okay, the government can't give you all the money, but we can help you team up. So we put a quarter, the states put a quarter, the private sector puts some money, and let's make a team. Let's have a partnership between the federal government and the private sector and the state government. But we asked people to put roots. We wanted them to send their schools, the kids to schools in this country, not move to China or Malaysia or India, or wherever, to do their manufacturing. And this is a very controversial program because we changed DOE's legal system completely. We made our legal people question the premises they've had for 40 years. Now we have a totally new way of thinking about uh, how to ask for intellectual property way beyond existing uh, paradigms. So that's a new area. Education is another area. Uh, my colleague here talked about having the right kinds of people. When we started Sunshot in January, we had zero PhDs in the program. We have 18 PhDs, and five of them, two of them are sitting right there, are so-called sunshot fellows. And these are the Greenberries, whatever analogy you wanna, you wanna take. These are the future generation of program managers. These are people who are licensed to kill. Meaning, intellectually, they have the bandwidth to go into any, anybody, a university, a lab, or an industry, and say, please show me your data. What did you do? And they have the license to not only fund people, but also to take away, like he was talking about. We have created an infrastructure. It takes a lot of effort, I can tell you. I have not slept much in the last one year. I haven't gone back home because my family is still, I have small kids and stuff, they're all back in California. But it, it is indeed possible. Let me, let me finish, I'm, I know we're kind of getting to the end of my, uh, my monologue period. I don't think we should have illusions in this. This is a very competitive business. We heard numbers of trillions of dollars. Just a solar business. When, note I didn't say if, when sunshot goals of dollar a watt comes to fruition, and we think it'll happen, we can make it happen by 2020, we think a significant portion of the electricity generation will happen from solar. And our calculations, primarily through NREL and our own diligence, is about 20% of the total electricity could be from solar. And you, you do the numbers on that, it's not an insignificant market. Let me just remind you of another market, another area which I was involved in, I'm still involved in, the semiconductor market. 25, 30 years ago, if you look at Andy Groves, which, who a person I absolutely adore, uh, if you look at his memoirs, they were talking about agonizing, do I take memories or do I take microprocessors? In the late 70s, memories were a very hot item, DRAMs were very big. People didn't know what to do with microprocessor. You can't live without a microprocessor now. And they said they were holed up in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a hotel in San Jose trying to make this decision. They gave up the memory market. We all know what happened to the memory market. We barely have a share of the market. And therefore, this collective uh, teaming of the federal government, the, the private sector, the states, 
has to happen to protect this market. This market is an order of magnitude, conservatively, bigger than the semiconductor market. We don't have a choice except to engage in it. If not, we're going to lose multi-trillion dollar market to other countries. The Excellent. big problem is... <laughs> that was a perfect conclusion, I thought. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I want to... I, I think a lot of these things um, are, are fascinating, and I, I, I think the amount of innovation research that's been done has not really been connected fully into uh, the energy space. Um, on the other hand, uh, having been here in Washington for a little while, uh, Rick Perry wants to get rid of the Department of Energy. Um, <laughs> And I kind of want to just play with this counterfactual for a little bit. Um, what if the Department of Energy got wiped out and then we decided we needed to do energy R&D? Because this is this, you know, it's kind of a Frankenstein of, of a place that's got, you know, nuclear weapons management, it's got nuclear waste management, it's got the existing national lab infrastructure that was created for a bunch of different reasons, a bunch of different places. Um, wh what would you do? Uh, and we, we it, this can sort of, let's, we can go anywhere here. Um, but what would, what would be the, the sort of first things that you do to create a sort of minimum viable, lean fighting R&D entity out of the, the DOE, assuming that you're starting with a blank slate because Rick Perry abolished it? I mean, I can, you know, obviously the, the most important thing is strategy. Um, you look at something like the Quadrennial Technology Review, which kind of you know, DOE released uh, a couple months ago now, I guess. Um, you know, it, it, it lays out, um, it kind of lays out the case uh, for technology, for markets. You know, it, it asks where are we going. It tries to identify kind of one of the, what are the, what are the key barriers that we're trying to achieve technologically. Um, you know, and it, 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 it sets out a, you know, a fuel mix. It kind of sets this overall direction. And out of this kind of broad, and you know, I mean, I think Sunshot is you know another great example of the importance of, of strategy. You know, um, you know, there's there, you know, if if you really want to kind of be lean and mean in your R and D venture, you know, that strategy is important. Once you have that have that strategy in place, then you can start pursuing the kinds of you know use inspired research that tends to to really kind of you know be the you know the the kind of you know lays the, the groundwork for kind of this innovation that actually gets transferred into the market over time. I mean... Nate, what would it look like? Would it have the national lab system? Is it? Well, I don't think we're going to get rid of the national lab system overnight, but I think you know, just a couple of days ago, the IG at DOE said that national labs right now are operating with about a 35% overhead rate. I think we all agree that that's a little bit of, uh, a little bit of fluff out there and that in these fiscal times, we've got to do better than that. So uh, clearly there's some opportunity, I think, to reform there. But if we're going to start from scratch, I think RPE is a pretty good model to look at. And if you could actually just slice it off the, uh, the, the beast of DOE, that's kind of the type of organization that you would want. You have flexible hiring authority. There's very low overhead. It's attracted the best and brightest minds right now. Uh, they're able to get their grants out very quickly through a very, very diligent uh, and transparent review process. They've catalyzed uh, private sector investment. And, uh, you know, you, I think you'd have to tweak the portfolio and you wouldn't want to be just high risk if that was your only institution, but that's a pretty good model to follow. Hey, can I say something about the national labs? But perhaps I, I should be careful because I do come from that kind of a culture. In my mind, the national labs should not be negotiated. I think their financial part should be negotiated. What they do for the country should be negotiated. But remember, there is no Bell Labs. There is some T.J. Watson. Xerox Park doesn't exist the way it existed 40, 50 years ago. And we should worry that we don't have a single collective area of where you can do broad scale research. The labs can do that, whether it's, 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 it's for defense or for the commercial or just a discovery process. So in my mind, I don't want to negotiate the national labs. We should ask more of them. We should, I, I think we should have national labs for the energy, just focused on solving energy problems. As a matter of fact, we are thinking that we will create out of SunChart, you know, centers of excellence, which goes all the way from taking a photon to electron to solving markets which doesn't exist now. If you look at national labs, they're very confined to a certain topic, so. So other, other countries have other models for doing research. So Germany has the Fraunhofer model, right. very heavy private sector engagement. Yep. I think you could look at, um, you know, how, where are, 
where states have chosen to invest in clusters. Um, so maybe Colorado, you know, maybe you ask Colorado how much, or the Western states, how much do you step up to support the cluster of research that's going on around NREL because it's become a job generator in that area. Um, I think. You know, it's important to not be too wedded to particular institutions, but to drive back to what's the asset, that's, what's the service that's being provided to the larger innovation system. Is there a more politically sustainable way to do it? And I don't know that answer because U.S. policy isn't my, my deep expertise, but I think um, it's important to ask those kinds of, maybe those challenging questions. Yeah. I mean, it's really interesting. I, I went on, for the Atlantic, I went on a road trip through the South looking at sort of technology startups and the sort of innovation ecosystems around them. And you can go to the reddest of the red states and you ask people there, you know, well, what are people doing to, you know, uh, encourage innovation here? And you see public-private public yeah. partnerships Absolutely. all the way. And so I'm, I'm interested in the sort of political solutions that can come out of these more uh, local, less national, less polarized kind of discussions. And the question then becomes, like, what's the sort of minimum viable innovation ecosystem for generating radical innovation? I mean, how small can we go? Can you do it at the city level? Do it need to be sort of states, coalitions of states? Um, how do you see sort of what the minimum viable system could be? I, th I think it's a, that's a complicated answer. So human, the way knowledge spreads is very person to person despite all, all our great technology and our scientific articles and, and these kinds of important tools. Fundamentally, you know, we're all here and we all spend our time on the Coffee Break networking because it's the human relationships fundamentally important. And we hear this about VC all the time, right? that venture capitalists you know, have this range, this radius that they'll work in because that human co connection is so important. So I think on one level, there's a, there's a, you have to have a sort of a critical mass of talent and people in a, in a place. So this is why you end up with clusters like you have in Colorado or the Silicon Valley. But the power sector in particular is so large, it's such big infrastructure, the market is spread very broadly. And the footprint of where a company might be selling is international. On one hand, you have a sort of international innovation ecosystem where you have these, you know, these large GEs and Siemens companies that you run into no matter which part of the world you're working in. Uh, so I think it, it's the collaborative network part, the, the way the cluster then links into the market and links into the international space becomes important. And it's not as easy as saying you, you could island off this. You know, if you got, you know, if you did X in Atlanta, then Atlanta could be, and, and Atlanta could be self-sufficient in this. It's, maybe you could build something in Atlanta, but it, the critical part will be how it's connected to the larger space and this this is you see India investing heavily in this in their solar mission sending scholars overseas trying to draw scholars in trying to connect into that international network while at the same time focusing on the cluster so it, it's a it's multi-dimensional yeah, yeah. did I have the cards of questions that just get collected I could grab those I love this I don't have to uh, well, actually, never mind. I don't know if I can read this. Let's see. <laughs> um, let me see. Ah, this, uh, this, while I focus on reading this one, let me ask them this one. Um, this is a good question. How recognizable a priori are successful disruptive technologies? Let's, let's go to you. Yeah, good question. How many of us know about fiber optics? Yeah. Right, and so this was a Bell Labs innovation. It had, not only Bell Labs, Corning discovered the fibers. They got the Nobel Prize for this. Sissy Kao got a Nobel Prize last year, year before maybe. Um, but you know, it, it takes a, it, I take a lot of blame for this. Engineers and the scientists don't do a great job of doing what um, Alex was talking about, about making it recognizable. And sometimes we take it for granted. Internet is another. It's just so pervasive, but you don't really say, oh, you know what, there's a lot of effort that went into it. And I don't think we do a fantastic job of making it recognizable. You know, flashing lights, you know, that, those kinds of stuff. But I mean, that was even maybe even about to scientists. Do scientists know? Yeah. yeah. Um, I figured this question out, so I'd like to ask it. Um, 
The question is, it says that DARPA is already doing great things in, in R&D. We know all about them. They're the sort of defining story of how government can be uh, useful. Um, and it has many times the funding of, of ARPA-E. Uh, so the question here is why are we reinventing, why are we recreating the wheel in, in ARPA-E? Like what's, why, why should we not just use DARPA to do our energy research? I mean, you know, partly it's, you know, it's obviously DARPA serves a very different community. DARPA, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, it's, it's there to, to serve the, uh, the armed services. ARPA E, I mean, in the energy sector, obviously, that affects all of us. It's, it's a much broader market. So, I mean, I think that there's, you know, I, you know, frankly, I mean, just it's not DARPA's mission to to, yeah. to do things beyond. Right. You know. By the way, I think uh, the key point in all of that is DARPA created an algorithm of how some things can be done, how disruptive technologies can be invented and put into a space with very, very efficient processes. Uh, their mission is not to do energy. They have energy built into their system because they consume, probably the biggest consumer. But it doesn't mean that they will drive innovations in energy efficiency. Who's going to discover the next thermoelectric with a ZTF5 that will change heater recovery? I don't think DARPA will do it. It'll happen from an ARPA-E type agency. Uh, if nothing, to draw focus to the scale of the problem. This is a humongous problem to deal with. And you need at least one agency. Maybe every country should have an ARPA-E, uh, which is coordinated globally, to solve this problem. I would also point out that you have a complexity with DARPA because of their defense mission. Um, you know, the military presents sort of a closed innovation system. They have their customer, they have their suppliers. It's, and there's a lot of that that's classified. And in this case, we need a much broader, there needs to be sort of more in and out, I, I would argue. Um, and that, you know, DARPA has real reasons why they have some of that uh, behind anyway, closed doors. There's one big difference. I was just thinking as she was talking, big difference, cost. Mm. DARPA's business doesn't, is not driven by cost because yeah. their customer is a very uh, exclusive customer. It's a defense. Energy is, is driven purely by cost. Because you don't care. I mean, if your LCOE goes up by a cent, you start going up. And so that the game is, is, has to be played at a very different level. There is a huge convolution function coming from the cost structure. And therefore, the thinking process has to be dramatically different. And I think it is. I mean, it's analogous to an extent, but uh, ARPA-E explicitly looks at how are we going to scale this technology and how is it going to yeah. compete in the ultimate marketplace. And that's right. what DARPA doesn't do. Yeah. Um, I'd actually like to ask you guys one of my own questions before I get back to these. Um, I was actually watching a, a great debate between Jesse Jenkins um, and, and a, a, another friend of mine, a guy named Christopher Mims, who has worked for a long time for Scientific American and Tech Review, about whether or not we can trust solar cost curves, essentially. Um, you know, we've, we've seen certain types of experience uh, cost cuts and you know, people look out and they project out in the future and they say, well, you know, in the next 10 years, maybe we don't need SunShot if we just sort of keep following this cost curve, scaling up, learning by experience, learning by doing. Um, how, how much can we, can we trust those cost curves and, and what can we do to maintain them or change them? And, and even, I think a lot of people might even say, uh, can we change them significantly? Okay, so, um, actually, there's a young lady there She's a, she's a fellow, That's ex she's, under, she's a physics PhD, but she's trying to understand the physics of learning curves or cost curves. Okay, so first point in that is, this is long-term data. This is data over decades where the cost, is, the, the production is changing over log scale, not linear scale. So a lot of data gets compressed. So if you try to resolve it on a very short time scale, you may get some very strange conclusions, which has no meaning in the long run. Okay. but. If you look at many different technologies, beer, all the way to solar panels to microprocessors, they all have this learning curve. It just says that the more you do, the better you become at doing that. Okay. But in solar, the cost curve for the module is only part of the story. It is following the, the, what I call the beer learning curve, 20% learning curve. Okay. The other cost, which is 50 to 70% of the cost, doesn't have a learning. It's actually going backwards. Then those costs are actually going up. And so uh, I don't think 
with the cost curve that Antonio was showing this morning, or that we know, whether you believe it or not, it's just an uh, empirical fit to, to, to existing data that will not lead to the sunshot rules. It has to be significantly different. Let me give you another uh, uh, reference point. If you look at data storage, in 1995, GMR, giant magneto resistance, which is why Ferret and Grunberg got the Nobel Prize a couple of years ago, it took place and it changed the curve. What Arun was talking about, there's a learning curve like this. In 95, when IBM put, it, put all of their, their read heads from GMR, that curve became like this. Then it transitioned into a totally different learning curve. That is what RPE is trying to do. That's what some of Sunshot's goals are. Transitioning from one railway path to a totally different railway path through a discovery. Let's see, we have, we have multiple ones. You guys want to talk about manufacturing? Yes. Anybody? <laughs> yes. Um, this is a question from uh, Katie Brown of AAAS. She says, uh, with respect to jobs, is it sufficient to focus on development and deployment functions and leave manufacturing to others? If not, how do we support American financial expectations with cost competitive uh, products? Well, I think you think about the whole innovation. You think about how you support innovators in the manufacturing space, how you increase your innovative capacity. So Department of Commerce has, and um, I'm gonna get the name wrong, but there's five US uh, departments working to support small and medium enterprises um, across the board on all sorts of manufacturing efforts and clean energy should slide right in there. You see Germany doing the same thing, supporting uh, manufacturers and it, it's not, uh, you know, it's things like making sure best practices are spreading widely, it's making sure they have access to new solutions, it's, it's supporting those innovators in that manufacturing space. I, I think you can't just sort of Assume again that you're going to, if you put in a market creation mechanism, the manufacturing will automatically follow. If you aren't also um, putting, in, ensuring the innovators in the manufacturing space have the support they need. Do we have a great example uh, internationally of a sort of high wage country that has been able to create lots of manufacturing jobs through innovation and clean energy? I'll let you talk about Germany. Oh yeah, well yeah. I mean, Germany's done. You know, has done, done quite a bit. Um, you know, one of the one of the I mean, one of the best countries you know, in the world in terms of uh, the investments they've made. But I think it, it's important to remember when you're talking about uh, you know it, you know innovation and manufacturing, the role that it's got to play. Uh, you know, it, I mean, the reality of it is that um, you know it, clean energy is seen as a as a major kind of source of jobs, and you know it's it can be true, um, but I guess the the point to remember is that you know, kind of the, the fundamental shift domestically from oil you know, and gas to you know renewables or, or what have you. I mean, it doesn't necessarily represent a, a net job gain. The real driver of job growth is uh, you know is going to be exports, right? Um, so you know, a country like Germany um, and others who are investing in their you know, domestic supply chains are, are trying to seek you know to, to, to focus in on the, you know, those pieces of the supply chain that they're particularly good at. Uh, and, and kind of you know capture those market segments. I mean that's it's 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 an absolutely important piece of the puzzle. I mean in some ways it's it's a similar story to other manufacturing sectors where it's you know it's just simply a matter of ensuring that the manufacturers have the best you know the best processes, the best uh, you know the, the able to adopt adopt the latest uh, advances in you know efficient production that kind of thing. But um, but it's absolutely absolutely critical. I mean, one, one question that's been uh, posed is as sort of we see, particularly in solar, the, the cost continue to fall. At what point does the realization that we're going to cross the line start to matter, right? Because people, you know, you can imagine being at a conference like this in six years, uh, you know, and it's going to be 2017. I mean, at what point does that visibility start to change the policy discussion? Um, and we have like good examples where we've been able to see a clear technological path and that path has ended up influencing policy in, in a way that would, in this case, provide more support for solar energy. I ask myself that question all the time. <laughs> and I don't have a good answer because we're almost there with wind. So solar, we've got this gap, but wind, I mean, there are installations that are at or close to grid parity. What's the role of, of financial support? What's the role of the other supports that are necessary to keep pushing those forward? I, I, 
stew about this, um, and I don't have a good answer. Um, other than just because you uh, got to a grid parity doesn't mean, okay, maybe that changes how you, do, how you think about the financial portion of the innovation system, but it doesn't change how you think about the infrastructure portion or the workforce portion or the rest of it. Those, those pieces all still are, play an important role. Um, but I, I, I personally wonder, you know, wind is so close, when do people start making different, are people already making different investment decisions in the field? And I think that bears some investigation. And maybe you thought about that more. Uh, For us, I think uh, that's why we said the 2020. We think by 2020, there's a real chance that we will hit the dollar award goal. And having said that, I think the module prices, every day, I'm more and more confident that we will hit the 50 cent uh, barrier. Uh, by may, not just one technology, maybe multiple, with, with some innovation. Uh, Antonio is plumb on the mark. It won't happen if we simply sit and watch it. Uh, it's not going to happen. I am a lot more um, um, skeptical or uh, concerned about the other costs. Unfortunately, uh, the previous panel talked about it. It's not simply that the panel, it's the entire system cost. Those really need some crazy innovations. As a matter of fact, our game plan is on the minute by minute change is changing. One of my staff members is out in California. Tomorrow, we will start to put totally new ideas into play, uh, which addresses the balance of systems uh, notions. Uh, unless we do crazy stuff, it's not going to change significantly. That's good. We may have an interesting sort of uh, story to watch in that in terms of wholesale electricity prices in Europe and solar, solar utility scale prices in Europe coming very, people are talking about them crossing in the next 18 months. And it, will that change decision making? Will that change feed-in tariff policy? I think there will be an interesting story to watch. That's great. Thank you very much. I think we're going to wrap up now. I want to thank everybody, especially Alexis, for uh, moderating such a good and informative panel. Uh, what we're going to do, there's box lunches out there. Uh, if you want to just go out and grab one, take a few minutes to come back, at least be back by 12.15. Uh, we'll hear from Senator Mark Udall uh, precisely at 12.20. So we'll see you back in just a few minutes. Thanks.